So today we have Dennis Merritt. Uh, he's going to be uh, talking about COVID-19 and how it uh, applies to Jungian psychology. Uh, and he will introduce himself. Uh, so Dennis, uh, let's hear about uh, COVID-19. Okay, well, thank you, Mark, and uh, thank you, everybody, for joining together. I'm a big fan of the forum. My wife and I moved to Milwaukee after living in Madison for 25 years. We moved here in 2007, and the forum has been my best way to find out uh, what's going on in Milwaukee and around the state and meeting a lot of like-minded people, so I'm uh, pleased to be able to present today. So I'm going to base my presentation on an article that I wrote and the Chinese are actually translating it and publishing it in a Chinese Jungian journal. So it's called COVID-19 Inflection Point in the Anthropocene Era and the Paradigm Shift of Jung's New Age. Grew up on a small dairy farm uh, in Kiwani County. That's the county just south of Door County. I called the title of my four volumes, The Dairy Farmer's Guide to the Universe, Jung, Hermes, and Eco-Psychology. So I decided by the eighth grade, I wanted to be an entomologist. And then year I graduated from high school, 1962, Silent Spring came out. Uh, it had a big effect on me and I did not want to be a spray jockey. After getting a master's and, uh, and bachelor's in entomology, I went out to Berkeley to work on a PhD in insect pathology. That's microbial control of insect pests. So you don't have to use chemical pesticides. And there is me, Sirsa, about 1970. 50 years ago, this last week, the Kent uh, State students were killed. It was after Nixon had sent the troops into Cambodia and all hell broke loose on the campus. So I was uh, a member of the University Lutheran Chapel and we had a free food project in our basement. I lived in the basement, I was the church mouse. Uh, I lived in one end of the basement, and this was the, the street people that were cooking the meals. They uh, stayed in the library at the other end. It was an amazing time to be in Berkeley. I consider myself to be a veteran of Berkeley of the late 60s. And I eventually got my PhD, Factors Influencing the Susceptibility of the Beet Army Worms, Podoptera exigua hubner, to a nuclear polyhydrosis virus discovered Jung by being in Berkeley and within nine months after starting to read Jung, which was in 1973, I applied to train at the Jung Institute in Zurich. And uh, there's Carl Jung, a uh, Swiss psychoanalyst, contemporary of Freud. This is his favorite picture of himself. It's one of my favorite quotes from yeah. Jung. It's by Yvonne Franz, uh, Jung's main followers. His personal injuries did not affect him as much as the suffering in the contemporary world, the continued devastation of nature, the overpopulation problem, the rape of the still flourishing non-Christian cultures, and the brutality of modern technology. For Jung, these problems were an agony which kept him constantly on, on the alert and watching for new possibilities for healing transformations that might emerge from the depths of the psyche. So I didn't realize until I started writing my books just how ecological Jung's conceptual system was. With that intro, uh, we'll okay, get good. to the heart of the matter here. We are at a, a, what I call an inflection point for our species at this moment. We have something that you can only see with an electron microscope called the COVID-19. And here is a abstract of the virus. It's a single strand of ribonucleic acid RNA is that circle in the middle. And we've identified all the various types of proteins. So it's just some software called ribonucleic acid that takes over the cell's system and causes the cell to produce more viruses. It stops the cell in its tracks. It's kind of like what happened at the beginning of World War II when uh, Roosevelt told the Ford Motor Company they had to start making tanks to kill oh. people instead of cars. That's what a virus does. It's not, it's not even fully a life form. I've always been fascinated by viruses, and one of the reasons I went into insect pathology I was thinking of 
transferring into virology. So here's another uh, schema of that virus. And they've got all these proteins labeled. And also the, there's a German scale of how this thing gets into the cell. Oh. But these recepting receptors on the cell surface and those spikes on the uh, virus that gives it this corona or crown, uh, crown effect are what attach to uh, the receptors on the cell. So what are some of the lessons that we can learn? Uh, these are the five lessons that I'll go through rather quickly. There are existential lessons about life and death, uh, demonstrates that we are all related and connected. I think the virus is halting our race toward oblivion as a species. It is exposing the ugly truths in American society. And I think it, that'll be a wake up call for, for even some of the most diehard Trump supporters. And like a nightmare, it shocks us into consciousness. Now as a Jungian analyst, I work a lot with dreams and a nightmare you can think of it as something that is, it shocks us into to being awake and is trying to shock us into some conscious awareness of something that is not working in our life or at the collective level, maybe in our culture. Let's look at the first one, the existential lessons about life and death. So I think it's uh, teaching us just how precious life is. All religious systems talk about the life and death relationship. And it makes us aware, as it's always good to be aware, especially in the second half of life, that our time on earth is brief. The second, that human relationships are to be treasured. All this uh, sheltering in place, uh, we really miss the, having other people to be present uh, in 3D form. Thank God for the internet, we can stay connected, but it's nothing like being together with human beings in the flesh. We humans are social animals and we need each other. Death makes us com contemplate our individual worth and the meanings of our lives and of existence. What's it all about? One of the important roles that I hope that this virus is gonna serve is to destroy some of the old destructive systems and forms, including religious and economic systems. And I think one of the beauties of the pandemic, in a way, it has, it has generated a fearful immediacy for our species and that we're all in this together. So there's been nothing like this before where every human on the planet, sooner or later, is going to be affected by this virus and the possibility that they could die. And that is an immediacy I felt back in the 1960s when I was 1A for the draft three times. When I knew I possibly had to go and fight that war, I tuned in as much as I could to what was going on. I educated myself about the war. And when you have skin in the game, you pay attention. So the Lakota Sioux say, Matakiwe Oyasin, we are all related. So this virus is, on the one hand, it showed us how interconnected we are nowadays with globalization. Another thing is that sooner or later, the disease will affect us all. We certainly see that here in Milwaukee. So if one part of the population, like a lot of the African Americans that have a lot of the underlying conditions that make them more vulnerable, there's gonna be a lot more disease in your area, it can spread a lot more easily. So nobody is going to be unaffected. And hopefully, because this virus is affecting the developed world first, it's going to sensitize us to the horrors that are going to be happening in the developing countries where they have a lot less resources to fight this thing. So it's waking up the developed world to need a lot of sensitization to what's happening, even in our country, to uh, like the Native uh, American populations. The virus is killing a lot of people and it's really dangerous, but there are a lot more dangerous things that were going on, especially climate change. This virus is like literally a warm up for what could be happening in the future. We were racing toward oblivion by our overconsumption. If everybody consumed at the rate of the Americans, we'd need, I think the estimate is six or seven planets. 
as a pathologist, I've been very concerned how we've been abusing our antibiotics because of the way we raise farm animals. You can't put a lot of one species in one place without running the risk of disease. That's one of the functions of disease is to limit populations for their own good. Uh, and we've been abusing antibodies on the cows and the chickens and, and everything. And we have just about destroyed the effectiveness of them for ultimately for human beings. Another thing is that the corporate agriculture has been mining the land and the water. The county I came from, we had 25 cows. There are several farms in the county now, one to 5,000 cows called concentrated animal feedlot. And what all that uh, liquid manure that seeps into the groundwater and 30% or more of the aquifers of the wells are contaminated with fecal material and nitrates. Uh, overpopulation, we have way too many humans on the planet because we've been able to control our uh, disease, that natural way of limiting populations is not there. And that means that we have to consciously limit our numbers. And any religion that is not on board with that, I think we should, you should look elsewhere because that is con contributing to the destruction of the planet. We've destroyed a lot of natural habitats and we've lost a lot of biodiversity. And many of us have become aware of the plastics in the oceans, uh, the loss of the fisheries. So I could go on, there's several other things, but we, we were just rushing headlong in that direction. And this virus now is like a giant pause. I mean, if you believe in God and that uh, things happen for a reason, it's like, what, what is the purpose? What's the reason for this uh, pandemic? I think another really important thing this virus is doing, it's exposing the ugly truths about our American society. So millions of Americans, we have known of uh, those in the, I don't think I have to tell anybody in the Unitarian Society about how many people don't have health insurance uh, or they have minimal insurance or insurance tied to their jobs and now their jobs are gone and they're stuck. And then the, the poor and the minorities in our country uh, and elsewhere have the underlying conditions that make them more vulnerable to this disease, hypertension, diabetes, a lot of asthma and lung problems. And what do you know? We're finding out that the essential workers are those in the food industries, in cleaning, garbage collection, maintenance, and so on. They're some of the lowest paid and more poorly insured. So hopefully this will make us aware uh, that these people are all a vital part, that they're just as important as doctors, nurses, and teachers. And I think, I'm hoping that a lot more people that are having to educate their kids at home because of the stay in place will come to appreciate and support the teachers. And one of the things in Obama we heard last night, some meeting he had, uh, some of the statements he made have gotten out and just how he's crucifying Trump for how he's dealing uh, with the situation. This is a time when you ne really need a central organization and help and advice and so on. And Trump has basically said every, every state is on their own and they're competing with each other for resources. Hope I'm not too political here. I was interviewed for an hour and a half on Friday on a new program called Failed State or when I go uh, more into a lot more detail than I will at this part of my presentation. I'm hoping this will be a wake up call for the all but the deadest of the diehard Trump reporters. So because every one of us has to consider that, that we could catch the virus, if not us, our grandparents or our friends, we have to, like I said, carefully evaluate everything we hear. The infection rates, and the death tolls are not fake news. That's been one of the ways Trump has been a master in being able to manipulate the culture and the government by calling things fake news. But death rates do not lie. And hopefully this will wake up the people that somehow weren't moved by the Mueller report, the Kosoji death, the Ukraine debacle, Trump's adulation of Putin and Kim Jong-un, 
Un, et cetera, et cetera. Or Trump, stable genius or evil genius? Every psychologist has labeled Trump a narcissist, even a malignant narcissist. But all politicians are narcissists to some degree. So my Jungian twist to this is I think that Trump is really the embodiment of the trickster, the archetype of the trickster figure. When you think of what Trump was able to do, he upended an entire field with some legitimate candidates like uh, uh, Bush from Florida in the Republican primary. There's some real gift to that. He's been able to turn the entire federal government on its head. There's a great article in the Atlantic Monthly about how he did that. And if you look at my article uh, on the COVID virus, it's on my blog site. It has a link to the Atlantic Monthly article in the notes. So one of the functions of the trickster is to hold up a mirror to a society. So by the ugly and the immoral things that the trickster does, it shows us the ugly and immoral side of ourselves and our cultures. And in our culture, the roots of our Western culture, namely Greek mythology, it was Hermes, which was Mercury in Roman mythology, who was recognized by Zeus for being a trickster figure. Now Hermes can lead the way or lead astray, and if you want to see Hermes in action, look at any drug commercial on TV. So how can the drug company sell you a drug when they got to tell you you might want to kill yourself, uh, you're going to be more vulnerable to tuberculosis and that sort of stuff. And the reason I mention this is that Hermes is also the god of advertising. That's what's driving the consumer culture. Now, there's uh, a good image of Hermes, and that's in my volume, Hermes, Eco-Psychology and Complexity Theory. Another message is that this virus came out of a wet market in China. Uh, there are a lot of wet markets in Asia. There is a link in the notes on my article on my blog to a, a couple of great videos about these wet markets. Basically, every living organism, including bacteria, have viruses. But in these wet markets, they have wild animals for all, from all over the world. A lot of Asians have these tastes um, and for maybe beliefs in some uh, magic healing abilities for a wild animal. Uh, they have these wild animals from all over the world and they're stacked on in cages on top of one another, defecating, urinating on those beneath them and so on under a lot of stress. So it's a real opportunity for viruses to recombine, to get together. And that's probably the source of this virus. And one of the men that had been campaigning to get rid of these wet markets is interviewed by an Australian journalist in this video that I have a link to on my website. And his statement is that this virus is nature's revenge. And to me, that's an archetypal dimension of the current situation. So take a Jungian look then at where we can go from here. Jungians work with the unconscious, collective unconscious, and every Jungian has a symbol system that they can relate to. My main symbol system is this Chinese book of wisdom called the uh, I Ching. In Chinese, it's called the I Ching. It's composed of 64 hexagrams, six lines, solid and broken, yin and yang lines. And this, to me, is the hexagram for our period in time. This is the archetypal situation. And it's called increase. And it's about the basic uh, archetype of increase. And the Chinese see that hexagram coming from a hexagram they call stagnation. The three yang lines at the top are associated with the spirit, like thinking, science, it's, and heaven. Its natural direction is up. Those three yin broken lines in the bottom are associated like at the archetypal feminine, the earth, and containment. The natural direction is down. So heaven and earth are out of relationship to each other. That's a very negative situation for the Chinese. That's called a standstill or stagnation. So you get hexagram uh, 42 that's on the right by that bottom line from, from those upper three coming down to help out those lower three yin. 
And here's what the Chinese say about that. The message of the hexagram, which is an archetypal image, is that those with power in whatever form come down to help the less fortunate. And in the Wilhelm Bain's translation, it says, this conception expresses the fundamental idea on which the Book of Changes is based, this Book of Changes as the Jing. To rule truly is to serve. A sacrifice of the higher element that produces an increase of the lower is called an out and out increase. It indicates the spirit alone that has power to help the world. I'll repeat that. A sacrifice of the higher element that produces an increase of the lower is called an out and out increase. It indicates the spirit that alone has power to help the world. How does rule by serving look in our culture? That means that we, that we deal with income inequality, racism, sexism, political and social inequalities, and the healthcare inequalities. We look at the major inequality in our species in relationship to all other species. And we have to realize how unique our species is in being able to bend the laws of nature entirely for the benefit of our species. And I mentioned before, diseases are a natural control for our species. So my title of my presentation is an inflection point in the Anthropocene era. The humans, we're like a cancer on the planet. You can think of what a cancer is in the body. It's cells growing out of relationship to all the other cells. And that's what humans are. We do not see ourselves as being part of the environment. Our laws and our systems are like a virus or computer software. These were created by humans, and they can be changed by humans. And Richard Reich wrote a book about that. He was uh, Obama's Secretary of Labor. Advertising is in Hermes' domain, one of the biggest problems for generating this Anthropocene or human-dominated era. Oh, by the way, I should mention what, that, what it means. It means that uh, an era uh, that is uh, characterized by something uh, unique and has the biggest effect in a big period of time. So this means that this current period is unique because of the human influence on the planet. Past eras have been started by like when that big meteorite hit the planet and wiped out the dinosaurs. So just major things like that. This is the first time that one species, namely us, is affecting the planet so much that it's being named after us. So we've been told by advertising that we can buy our way to happiness or meaning. Now, Jung was the inspiration for Alcoholics Anonymous. He saw Bill W. in his practice in the 1930s. Bill W. was one of the co-founders of AA. And uh, he told W. that I can't cure you. You're going to have to find a spiritual practice to deal with something as great as an addiction. So just like now, how do we get people away from thinking you can buy their way into happiness? We have to find equally powerful things that they can do to find meaning in life more family time, self-development, community involvement, and so on. And corporations are the modern day monsters. I'll get into that in a minute. So here's part of the Anthropocene era. This is a tar sands mine up in Canada. And these are some powerful images that illustrate to me how artists can help us in this process. There's a wonderful series of um, photographs that uh, they had on display at the Chazen Museum in Madison uh, several months ago. And these are by uh, Fabrice Montero. He created 13 photographs that he called a prophecy. They're set in Senegal in West Africa. And I'll quote from the artist's description. It says, the earth has sent spirits to tell humans they have the power to reverse what they have done to the planet. So what he was depicting were supernatural spirits called jinn that conjure up the souls of the landscapes that have been altered and erased by humans. Now this first one is the spirit of a dump site near Dakar, Senegal. That site was created in 1968. And that massive pile of refuge that covers the soil and the water was 
put on top of a natural swamp in the vicinity of uh, Dakar. It has contaminated the soil and the water with heavy metals. But it also provides jobs and income for the local people. They have to risk their health for the opportunity to earn a living. So here's a close up of that figure, that gene. And that's probably as our species coming up, unfortunately. Here's a second prophecy. A uh, quote from the artist's description of this image, wearing a gown coated in tar, the jinn in Montero's second prophecy personifies the threat of accidental oil spills to marine ecosystems. This happened when a Spanish fishing ship ran aground in a natural park that is offshore of the coast of Senegal. Here's something that uh, people who work with dreams notice, and you see it in myths and so on. We can personify powerful forces in ourselves as in, in nature. And Jung said that modern day monsters and dragons were the big things, like big machines, big militaries. So what is now ruling the planet, I think as Jung would see it, is the monster of the modern day corporation. If you think of a corporation, it is just there to make money, uh, reports on a quarterly basis, the profits to the shareholders, the people are dispendable, and the environment is a resource base and a waste dump. And if we can't change that, we're gonna continue our pursuit of oblivion. We have to think big in terms of a paradigm shift to deal with what's going on. So the second part of my title was Inflection Point as described by the paradigm shift in the New Age. Jung in 1940 coined the terms New Age and Age of Aquarius. He realized there had to be a paradigm shift in the West in the many things that we were doing. And a paradigm shift is, uh, is dangerous. Anytime you have a lot of transitions and we're in a lot of danger now. So Jung thought symbolically he thought the Christian era was the age of Pisces. It started at the same time about Jesus' birth, and that's two fish swimming in opposite directions. But the age of Aquarius uh, is happening now. This is uh, what you see in the sky. So Aquarius is a water bearer. It's, it's an air sign. It's not a water sign. It, it can control where to put the water in, how much. So if you think of water as psychic energy, the way Jung thought of where we are now is a, a Aquarius is pouring water, conscious energy, into the mouth of the southern fish. Fish are a signs of the unconscious. Jung said that our challenge is to bring as much light of consciousness as possible into the unconscious. And his definition of enlightenment was not by imagining figures of light, by bringing, his, but by bringing as much consciousness into the unconscious. So we have to be conscious of who we are as a species, what we can do to each other, how murderous we can be, realize the damage we can do to the environment and to each other. That's the challenge for the age of Aquarius. So these are some of the five attributes of the new age. A special role for the feminine. Uh, Nancy Pelosi is one of my heroines there. Emergence of new spiritual forms. That started um, in the, with the Beatles and in the 60s. Every campus had its Hare Krishnas. Christian integration of the vital elements of the heathenism that they had been persecuting. Jung said one of the challenges for modern men and women was to integrate their cultured side with the indigenous one within. Another attribute of the uh, new age, an end to the degradation of the environment. And then painful awareness of the fragmentation within ourselves and in our society, and the God image that hopefully will produce the transcendent function that will give us a new God image that leads to transformation and psychological growth. Jung was from a strong Christian background, and he saw as one of his main elements was to analyze the Christian myth slash religion, and that it was a dead myth that needed to be revitalized. And to me, indications of it being dead are a bunch of old white guys in the Vatican 
trying to cover up the sexual abuse, and in Protestantism, evangelicals and fundamentalists that can support Trump. I mean, how can that be Christian? The Financial Times of London, which is sort of their equivalent of the Wall Street Journal, has pegged the present moment, this revolutionary period that the virus has brought about. Uh, incredible things can happen, and it says, I have a link to this in my uh, article on my blog. The great test all countries will soon face is whether the current feelings of common purpose will shape the society after the crisis. Radical reforms reversing the prevailing policy direction of the last four decades, namely the neoliberalism, will need to be put on the table. Governments will have to accept a more active role in the economy. They must see public services as investments rather than liabilities and look for ways to make the labor markets less insecure. Redistribution of wealth will again be on the agenda. The privileges of the elderly and the wealthy are in question. Policies until recently considered eccentric, such as basic income and wealth taxes, will have to be in the mix. And here's from the historian Yuval uh, Harari. This was in an April 5th NPR interview. Again, the link is on my website. And he talks about the rare opportunities we have now because of the extreme fluidity in uh, our culture and that old solid forms could be quickly overturned. So we're experimenting with a lot of new things that were considered to be crazy like university basic income and safety nets. But the future is not predictable. Many things are on the table. Now, the people that have articulated the directions for the future that I like the most are called the Greener Sustainable Economist. This is a book I really like, Enough is Enough. And these are some of the main attributes of these new economies. Wealth dis redistribution on a planetary level, Decreasing working hours by almost half, allowing more time for spending with the family hobbies and so on. Spreading the work hours around the planet because there's not enough jobs to go around and then automation is something we haven't addressed and limiting our population numbers. So Jung's definition of enlightenment I already said, and Jung said we need more psychology. We are the source of all coming evil. And another quote from you, nature must not win the game, but she cannot lose. And whatever the conscious mind clings to, clings too hard and fast to the concept since it gets caught in its own rules and regulations is as unavoidable and of the essence of a civilized consciousness. Whenever that happens, nature pops up with her inescapable demands. That's where we are now. To uh, quote my last uh, statement in the article, we are in a period of massive uncertainty, fear, and confusion. A diminishingly small virus has stopped us in our tracks. We have been racing toward oblivion, and no economic or environmental disasters seem to be able to change our direction. Maybe our species and the planet needed this virus to shake us into consciousness. How we respond and go forward is of utmost importance. And Naomi Klein said, the future will be determined by whoever is willing to fight harder for the ideas they have laying around. And this is my contribution to some ideas laying around. So like I said, this article is on my blog, youngenecopsychology.com. I have an article on there on Glenn's in the American Psyche. Uh, Jungian Perspective on Climate Change, Hunger Games from a Jungian Political Environmental Perspective. I'm working to get my website, Eco Jung, back up. There's my email address, dennismerit4 at hotmail.com. And if you email me, I can send you uh, the link to a video, Seasons of the Soul, about the archetypal and mythical dimensions of Midwest weather and seasons. And eventually, when that failed state interview comes up, I can let you know. So thank you. Now we can see if people have some questions. It says, can you say more about the Jungian concept of the trickster? Yeah, the trickster is, it's an element always at the fringe of a culture and a society. It's, uh, it's like at the border between total chaos and stability. 
and you need tricksters. You need people that aren't fully invested in your culture uh, to be able to shake things up and to point out what's wrong with the culture. I see Hermes as the god of complexity theory. This this incredible math that emerged in the 1960s. New things emerge when you're in that zone between something that's stable and total chaos. Hermes is also the god of sleep and complexity theory is what happens in sleep. The, the tricksters are really important. We see it, for example, uh, Br'er Rabbit, Br'er Fox, um, the Roadrunner, Coyote, that's a Native American uh, figure. E every culture has had it. In the uh, ring cycle uh, that Wagner did, Loki was a trickster. It's an archetypal figure in every culture. The, one of the trickster figures in the Sundance I went to he actually was a um, Dr. Quinn medicine woman, but he had a, had a nice day badge on and wore a Mickey Mouse uh, necklace and, and that sort of stuff. They do everything back. Oh, the name of the artist, Fabrice, F-A-B-R-I-C-E. And Fabrice's last name is Mon Montero, M-O-N-T-E-I-R-O. So if you uh, Google Fabrice Montero, the prophecy, you get all the images and all the descriptions. Uh, how do I see the current protest against the stay at home? Well, that's what's so desperate about the moment. I mean, y if you go out, you could risk getting the virus, but boy, what, with, if you lose your livelihood in the kind of culture we have with, with very poor safety nets, with insurance tied to your job, uh, that's one of the, the, uh, the real weaknesses in American culture that are being revealed. The big atrocity was the Republicans forcing us to hold an election. Here in Milwaukee, we had have 120 polling stations and we got reduced to five. So these, these things hopefully will wake people up as to just the subtle ways that we are losing our democracy and do read that article um, in uh, the Atlantic Monthly. On overpopulation versus overconsumption uh, in relation to value of life. Michael Moore has uh, a new film out available free, but my God, it's uh, I really am disappointed in Michael Moore. One of the things he talked about at the end was about limiting human populations. You have to be so careful about that because you get into eugenics and so on. If you wanted to reduce overconsumption, by limiting population, you would start by eliminating all the Americans. We, pr we consume, what, 25 times more or whatever than uh, some, uh, somebody in a poor country? Consumption is determined by the number of people and how much uh, they consume per capita. In the new green sustainable economy, we do have to reduce our human numbers and we, especially the developing countries or developed countries have to reduce their consumption. We have to go back to a much simpler lifestyle. Atlantic Monthly article, it's on my blog, jungianecopsychology.com. It's the, the COVID-19 article. I forget the name of it, but it is fantastic. Trump, like I said, I think is an evil genius, not a stable genius. He has an incredible ability. We have to admire that in the same ability that Hitler had in some ways. Also a great article in the Atlantic Monthly how it's really the top 10% that are doing well and not the 1%. If you can't find it, but just Google Atlantic Monthly top 10%. It, will this recording be available? It was very helpful. One of the reasons I offer to do these talks, quite frankly, it's the only way I keep from getting totally bummed out by uh, the environmental situation is I put the talks on my blog. So I have uh, uh, another long interview based on my article already on my blog. It's the first thing on there, which is youngecopsychology.com. Excuse me, this is BJ. We are, uh, I know I'm going to be working with the office to uh, find a spot on the First Church website that we can post uh, some of the, uh, what any of the forums that we have recorded and we're trying to record them all so we are looking into that so that it'll be on First Church. I'm not sure when that will happen 
but we definitely want to save these uh, terrific encounters. Oh, great. Like I said, I, I am a huge fan of the forum. Any other questions? Gosh, I guess I didn't say enough, Mark. <laughs> um, I definitely think you should show everybody your badger, though. <laughs> I was talking to Mark um, yesterday, and uh, he says, is that a badger in the background? And I found that Mark and I did taxidermy work in high school. I didn't do the badger, but I did the owl you see up in the corner. So let me go get the badger. There he is. Hey there, folks. <laughs> <laughs> so my son lives in Hong Kong and five years old, so we have to Skype and I have to get my badger down, so I do little games with him. Is it, hey, Aaron, you've been a good boy. You're not a good boy, I'm gonna bite your butt. You're gonna bite your butt. <laughs> so, but they're, they're just really remarkable uh, animals. I'll see if I can. Show, show them here, but there's some of the champion uh, diggers in on the entire planet. You, um, you know, we're, we're talking, oops, I'm sorry, we're talking about some fairly major changes. Would, would Young expect them to happen without violence? Um, well, I love that question. I personally think that Young's conceptual system is one of the best ways to analyze the current dysfunctional situation that we're in, in relationship to each other as a species and our species in relationship to the environment. I titled my writings, uh, Jungian Eco-Psychology. And eco-psychology is a new field in psychology that started to emerge in the mid-1990s. And it's a study of the human relationship with the environment. And one of the things that it uh, picked up on is from deep ecology and Arnie Nice, a Scandinavian philosopher, who said we have to analyze things at the deepest possible levels. Uh, Jungian psychology working at the archetypal levels and the idea of the collective unconscious, I think provides the deepest analysis. So if you can understand things at, at a deep level, you're in a much better position to be able to do something about it. And I personally think that the uh, cognitive behavioral therapy that dominates psychology, it's a lot of excellent things about it, but I don't think it has the, the depth to be able to do these deep analyses. For example, Jung uh, saw that uh, Christianity, the way it has evolved, is really a detriment to the environment because Humans are the only thing made in God's image. So what's, what's about the rest of this stuff? It's not sacred. So Jung picked up on the alchemist in, in our Western tradition and saw that those people working in secret were really trying to complement what Christianity left out, the feminine nature, um, animals, uh, sensuality. For me, this Jungian eco-psychology is uh, the, the most powerful environmental type work we can do uh, because of the analysis at the deep level. I'm doing what I can. I got to get two more books out, uh, but it's mostly stuff that I already have written this on my, my blog and my website. And then I want to do a series of podcasts for young people, the none, none of the above when it comes to religion. I, I really think that they need some ideas about how we got into this mess and how to go forward. I think we could change things significantly and in a good way. One of my few hopes is the internet, that we can come up with some good stuff. It can be widely distributed, but I'm not holding my breath. I'm not very optimistic about our species. And if you look at what's happening around the world, we have a Trump of the South with Bolsonaro. We have uh, authoritarian um, elements in Russia and in Poland. It doesn't look very positive. But Trump has been excellent for being able to, uh, I call him the divider in chief, and for being able to uh, 
stay in power by uh, appealing to a xenophobic racist base. It's easy to play on people's fears and it's a real challenge to to honor what all religions and um, uh, psychoanalysis and, and modern psychological theories based on, namely love. So um, I'm hoping, but like I said, I'm not holding my breath. Uh, Dennis, I have a question. Uh, could you um, tell us a little bit more about the connection uh, that you see between uh, uh, Jung and the I Ching uh, hexagrams? Oh, okay. Wilhelm Bain's translation is of the I Ching is my favorite book in the world. It's a compendium of Chinese wisdom and philosophy. And I think at the core, it's the archetype of number. But these great Chinese sages, starting back in 1050 BCE, put together the first trigrams, and the, the Jing actually goes back to Chinese shamanism. So we're talking about the oldest culture on the planet. They had something called oracle bones, and the shamans would uh, scratch a question on a bone, and that was those images on those bones were the prototypes of uh, Chinese uh, picture words or ideographs. And then King Wen, 1050 BCE, put six of those uh, yin and yang lines together to make a hexagram and then did, did some commentary. And every major Chinese thinker, writer, philosopher has commented on since then. And you got a taste of the wisdom in what I read in, in the hexagrams 42. So it's a book full of archetypal images, basically, a total of 4,096 uh, images. Jung used it extensively starting in 1919. What you can actually do, and this is what discredits Jung to a lot of the scientific uh, um, uh, psychologists in Western mind, you can actually put a question to the book. It has to be a really important question. Like, let's say you have a relationship problem and you ask the book, Wisdom to Guide Me in My Relationship with My Wife. So you do something that'll generate numbers. Most people toss coins that'll generate numbers, and then those numbers translate into lines, and then you read the answer in the book depending on one, you know, what lines that you get. And that's called synchronicity. There's no way you can have an intrapsychic state, a problem, do a random process, and get a meaningful answer in the book. We, they, we, that can't be described in the West. But it's what Jung called synchronicity. And uh, starting the age of Aquarius, I think, was in 1968, my first full year in Berkeley. In 1967, Pink Floyd, my favorite group, the Umaguma album, I was at their first concert in 1968 in San Francisco. Pink Floyd's first album, Pied Piper at the Gates of Dawn, had a cut called Chapter 24. They were singing right out of Wilhelm's book under hexagram 24 called The Turning Point. So if you Google Pied Piper, The Gates of Dawn, chapter 24, and then look at Wilhelm's translation, you can get it online. They were singing about uh, the, the I Ching. So it's, um, it's just an incredible book of wisdom. I've made a good connection with, it was actually the first Chinese Jungian analyst. Um, I've given talks on the Jing over in China. I have a paper about using the Jing in the therapeutic setting that's been translated in the Chinese. And I see it as a real potential way for China and America to come together uh, through this uh, amazing book.